really enjoyed the conference. Uh, I hope you will be able to organize more in the next years. Uh, this work has been done. So this uh, presentation will be a lot different from the presentation you have had, have had in this week. Uh, it's more a mathematical presentation. Uh, and it's not really on viruses, but in, is on uh, self-assembly in nanoparticles. I hope you will not be too bored and some nice questions will pop up. Uh, this work has been done uh, in collaboration with uh, Raidun Twarok at the University of York and uh, with uh, a structural biologist, Peter Burkhardt, at the University of Connecticut. And uh, the idea that we want to explore uh, in this talk uh, is if we can classify some specific class of self-assembly nanoparticles, namely the one created in Petersburg at lab, uh, and classify them based on uh, geometry. And luckily for this kind of uh, self-assembling nanoparticle, uh, they don't obey to the Casper and Klug classification because uh, they are assembled from uh, a polypeptide engineered in such a fashion that it forms pentamers and trimers, but many more pentamers than the one allowed by the Casper and Klug classification. So we have to come up with something different. And the idea is to um, try to mimic a classification that already exists, the classification that has been given uh, by Fowler and Manopoulos uh, for uh, fullerenes. Um, why self-assembling polypeptide nanoparticles? Well, as the number of proteins in the data banks is increasing, there are new possibilities to design synthetic nanoparticles, and they are used for medical, for medical applications. Uh, they can, use, uh, can be used for drug delivery, gene therapy, and in particular, the one I'm focusing on is used for uh, vaccination. The idea is not new in the field. The first one uh, in thinking about doing um, um, uh, synthetic uh, self-assembling polypeptide nanoparticles were Padilla, Kovalev, and Yates in 2001. Uh, they uh, tried to, or they engineered a fusion protein that uh, is uh, shown here on the cartoon on the left that had uh, two domains, one domain with, uh, in green with the ability to form dimers, and the second domain in uh, red that had the ability to form uh, trimers. And then they linked these two regions. And uh, they were able to form uh, layers of uh, these uh, uh, polypeptides, but they were also able to form uh, closed cages of these polypeptides with uh, uh, a chosen symmetry. And in particular, here's a, here is a computer model of uh, a tetrahedral nanoparticle formed by 12 of these uh, uh, um, fusion proteins uh, with uh, an edge of uh, about uh, 50 nanometers. But it took them uh, 10 years to be able at the end to really crystallize uh, the nanoparticle and they did it in uh, 2012. So the system I want, the specific system I want to focus on uh, is a system that has been developed by Peter Burkhardt at the University of Connecticut. And uh, uh, it assembles from a three-dimensional building block. Uh, and this building block is a polypeptide that has two domains. If you look at this cartoon, uh, it has one domain in blue, shown in blue here, that it has the ability to assemble with other two uh, blue domains. So it goes to form a trimer, it forms a trimer. And then it is linked to a second domain, shown in green here, that has the ability to assemble with other four domains of the same uh, kind, and it forms pentamers. And uh, they are able to form, uh, um, to form uh, self-assembly nanoparticles, so the, the nanoparticles self-assemble. And here is a computer model of uh, a nanoparticle made by 60 fusion proteins. In this case, uh, the, um, the nanoparticle has been reconstructed with icosahedral symmetry, and in this case, the Casper and Kluge classification would work because you just have 12 pentamers in this uh, configuration. Um, but for the other nanoparticle that they are trying to construct, then the classification would not work. So this, this reconstruction has been done by Burkhardt's lab. And what are they using the, the, this nanoparticle for? They want to use it uh, as a repetitive antigen display system. Uh, they further extend uh, the polypeptide that they have by surface protein of the pathogen. So they put or at the trimeric end or at the pentameric end or on both end some fragments of the uh, surface protein of the pathogen and they further extend this polypeptide. And then they let the nanoparticle assemble 
and at the end you have a form nanoparticle where on the outer surface you have the antigen that are displayed. And they are displayed in several copies. Um, and uh, the other thing is, is they are displayed or in trimers or in pentamers, or for some of the vaccines that they are trying, uh, they are uh, displayed in both uh, cases, so in trimers and uh, uh, in pentamers. And they are trying to do this for uh, several diseases, for SARS, for influenza, and they have uh, a trial that is starting for uh, malaria, for uh, um, um, uh, that is trying in uh, a short. Why do they want to, do, to try to use this uh, new kind uh, of vaccination? Well, because the cost of production, of production are lower, uh, because um, they have told me that the particle uh, is stable at the room temperature, so they don't have the problem uh, of uh, maintaining the, the cold uh, of chain, and uh, also that they, uh, for people that are afraid by injection, uh, there is a, this is the good news. It will not be uh, given by injection, but you will breathe it uh, through the nose. Um, so when they contacted us, uh, the information that they gave us were uh, that the nanoparticle was given, uh, had these properties to assemble in trimers and the pentamers, so the polypeptide had the ability to assemble in, in trimer and pentamers, and they were also able to tell us that there were uh, some, uh, um, from the scanning and um, transmission microscopy, uh, there were some uh, uh, mass peak corresponding to particles that ma uh, were made around 230 uh, to 310 and 360 chains. So they were puzzled and they asked, and they were not able to reconstruct these nanoparticles with the usual Casper and Kluge classification. They were puzzled and they asked us if there was a mathematical way to reconstruct the geometry of the nanoparticle. So what I want to point out is that I will just focus on the connectivity of these polypeptides. I will see these polypeptides as if they would be a string, and I will explain you which is the mathematical object that that I will use, and I will just look at the connectivity between the different proteins. So, um, but uh, as I said, uh, unluckily the Casper and Klug classification doesn't work. So the question that we want, that we want to uh, answer is what are the symmetric structures that can occur as a result of self-assembly? And symmetric is in brackets because the classification that we give and that I will show here is for symmetric nanoparticles up to 360 polypeptides. But the procedure that we have constructed will also work with nanoparticles that have, don't have any symmetry. Um, so the procedure has, have, has four different steps. Step number one, we determine the possible, top, the possible topology of the particles. And by topology, I mean the connectivity between the different proteins. Uh, step two, uh, we determine if there is a symmetry, which constraint that does the symmetry impose on the nanoparticle. And step three and step four uh, are connected one with the other. We, are, we base our construction on uh, fullerene, so we uh, look for a fullerene that we call somehow equivalent, and we will say what's equivalent to the nanoparticle, fullerene equivalent to the nanoparticle, and then when we know which fullerene we want to use, we get back to the nanoparticle. So let's get started. Uh, this is the final slide, not of the presentation, but of the work. Um, I show you the final results so you know where I want uh, to get. Uh, the idea is that I want to find a mathematical object that represents my nanoparticle. And I represent my nanoparticle by what's called in mathematics a spherical graph. So uh, it's an object that has some uh, vertices. The sphere represented in white represents vertices that we say of degree five. There are five edges coming in. And uh, other vertices of degree three that are the spheres in, uh, that are here shown in black. And this corresponds at the position of uh, the trimers and uh, of the pentamers. And then we connect these vertices by edges, and the edges represent the, um, represent the polypeptide. We don't take into to account here this edge between the uh, two different uh, domains. We're just thinking as a first approximation because we just want to look at the connectivity as a straight edge. Um, so, as I said, we uh, want to model our nanoparticle by, uh, a, um, by, uh, by a graph. 
Uh, and here, shown in a cartoon, you see that you have uh, uh, vertices of degree three in red and vertices of degree five in blue. Uh, what, what is important to see is that you don't have any edges between vertices of degree five and degree five or edges of degree three and degree three. So the edges just connect degree five with degree three. And this comes from the fact that we are modeling the polypeptide as the connection between uh, the trimers and uh, the pentamers. And this is what in mathematics we call a bipartite graph. So we have two set of vertices and these are just connected one with the other. So for a graph on a sphere, or in general a graph, uh, a relation like this that it's called Euler formula holds, and it relates the number of vertices in the graph with the number of edges in the graph and the number of faces. And then we are in a specific system, and this specific system assembles with these polypeptides that form trimers and pentamers. So we have a further an, another condition, and the other condition is that the number capital N of the fusion protein that are in this, into this nanoparticle must be a multiple of uh, 15, because we want all the pentamers and all the trimers formed in the nanoparticle. So from this condition and this condition, we obtain that we can express the number of faces by uh, this uh, formula, with, where M is dependent on the number of uh, fusion protein that we have in our nanoparticle. Then there is some nice theorem in mathematics. We don't look at the theorem. We just know that it holds for our nanoparticles. And what it, this theorem tell us, tells us is that there is a rela relation between the number of edges and the number of vertices. And if we translate this relation in for, the, uh, for our nanoparticles, so in the number of edges uh, and the number of trimers and pentamers that we have in our nanoparticle, we uh, come out with uh, this relation here. So we have a, a, a condition and the condition is that M, the small M that we have found before that defines the number of faces in the nanoparticle and that is dependent on the number of polypeptide that we, ha we have in the nanoparticle has to be greater or equal than four. And in the case that it's exactly equal to four, then you, you, you find again the nanoparticle that I've shown before at the beginning for which we had the computer model with 60, uh, with, uh, 60 uh, polypeptides. Um, so at this point, we have uh, modeled our nanoparticle by a graph that has vertices, vertices of degree three and vertices of degree five. We can also look at the faces of our graph, and the faces of our graph, uh, for uh, as the because the, since the, um, the graph has be, uh, is a bipartite, bipartite graph. Uh, will be all with uh, an even number of edges. And this depends on the fact that uh, the vertices of degree, five, degree 3 and degree 5 have to alternate around the boundaries uh, of the faces. So we made a choice, and the choice that we made was to choose uh, just rhombic and hexagonal faces. But in principle, you can also choose bigger faces, octagonal or decagonal faces. And you can write down a relation. Um, an equation about uh, the number of edges uh, in uh, your tiles. Uh, in this case, you will have uh, four edges for a rhomb, uh, for uh, six edges for a hexagon, and the number, uh, this total number of edges will be equal of two times the number of polypeptides or edges in the, part, the nanoparticle, because each edge is shared between two adjacent faces. And from this relation and the, one that the, and the equation that we had before on the faces, we can express the number of rhombic faces in dependence of uh, m, the small m that we had in the first slide. So we know that the number of rhombs and the number of hexagon is fully determined when we know how many polypeptides are in our nanoparticle. In this case, if we get back to the uh, first example, the, the case in which m is equal to 4, then the nanoparticle graph associated to the nanoparticle uh, is a graph of uh, what is called a rhombic uh, triacontahedron. And it's uh, a polyhedron that has um, uh, icosahedral symmetry and uh, has just uh, um, rhombic faces. In fact, uh, for m equal to 4, there are no hexagonal faces. So this would be the nanoparticle graph, the mathematical object we will look at when we are trying to classify the nanoparticles in the specific case we had before. Uh, here are, is just a table that shows uh, uh, that you can compute uh, the, how many rhombic and how many hexagonal faces you have, and they have made special choices, and the special choices are motivated by the next slide, where I make some choices about uh, symmetry. 
So at this point, what we have done, we have associated to our nanoparticle a mathematical object, a spherical graph that has uh, vertices of degree three and degree five, and we have computed how many, depending on the number of uh, polypeptide in the nanoparticle, we have computed how many hexagonal and how many rhombic faces we have uh, into the graph. Now we want to look at symmetry, and the reason we want to look at symmetry is that if we, just, if we work with symmetry, we are allowed just to work in the fundamental domain, and this makes things uh, much easier. But as I said before, uh, we were also able to work uh, without uh, symmetry. Uh, we will focus here just on tetrahedral, octahedral, and icosahedral symmetry, but uh, we also have classified uh, particles with uh, lower symmetry, so we have reconstructed particles with lower symmetry. Uh, we call uh, capital P the number of uh, pentagonal cluster or vertices of degree, phi, uh, of degree five in the fundamental domain, and we call capital T the number of uh, triangular cluster or vertices of degree three in the fundamental domain. So as an example, I look at uh, the tetrahedral symmetry, and here you have a cartoon of uh, a grid of a, um, of a tetrahedron where I have highlighted the fundamental domain, and you can see that there are special positions at the vertices. There are uh, three, two threefold sides uh, at the vertices, uh, of, at the corners uh, of the faces of the tetrahedron and at the center of the faces of the tetrahedron. So you can um, put into relation the uh, number, you can express the number of polypeptides that you have in your nanoparticle via the number of uh, pentamers in the fundamental domain or via the number of trimers in the fundamental domain. So let's do it for the pentamers. So how many pentamers you will have in the, uh, in the nanoparticle, nanoparticle with uh, capital N uh, polypeptides will have a number P of pentamers sitting in the fundamental domain, so capital P is the number of pentamers sitting in the fundamental domain, you have 12 copies of the fundamental domain that tessellate uh, uh, the tetrahedron, so you multiply by 12, and then you multiply by five because you have five proteins in the pentamer. You, could do, you can do the same thing for the trimers, so trimers in the fundamental domain are capital T, you multiply by 12 because 12 is the number of copies of the fundamental domain, and you multiply by three because three is the number of, of proteins in the trimer. But then you have to take care also of this special positions here, and you have four copies of these special positions and four copies of this special position. So if there is a trimer sitting in one of these positions, then alpha or beta will be equal to one. Otherwise, if there are no trimers sitting in this position, alpha and beta are equal to zero. And here are some of the possible chain numbers up of uh, 360. These are all the chain numbers, uh, part, chain numbers for which we have particles that can have uh, uh, um, sorry, tetrahedral symmetry. And for this, we have computed where uh, the trimer uh, sit if they stay in the fundamental domain or if they sit uh, in some of the special positions. Uh, and you can do the same thing for uh, the icosahedral symmetry. The only difference is that you have to keep in mind that now you can put a pentamer in this special position and you compute it in a similar way and you find a similar solution for uh, the icosahedral particle and also for the octahedral particle. You, the reasoning is uh, always the same. The only thing you have to keep in mind here is that we have made a choice. We have chosen just to work with the rhombic and the hexagonal um, faces. Therefore, we will not have in our model any uh, solution with uh, octahedral symmetry because uh, this, uh, in this spe special position you cannot put any trimer and you cannot put any pentamer because it's a four, four, four fold position but you cannot put also any of the tiles uh, that we have chosen because the tiles that we have chosen, rhombs and hexagons, are decorated by trimers and pentamers on, along the boundary and so the, uh, they will not fit uh, with uh, um, the four, four fold uh, um, rotations there. Um, so at this point, what we have, we have modeled our nanoparticle by a graph with uh, vertices of degree three, with vertices of degree five. We know, depending on the number of polypeptides that we have in the nanoparticle, how many rhombic faces we have and how many um, hexagonal faces we have in the nanoparticle. And if there is any symmetry, if there is any symmetry in the nanoparticle, we also know where the pentamers will sit and where the trimers will sit. If 
with, they will sit in the fundamental domain or in special positions. Now we want to classify all of, this, uh, uh, all of these particles. And in order to do this, uh, we uh, refer to uh, fullerenes. So fullerenes are carbon molecules, uh, C, uh, N, and uh, they can be represented by three regular spher spherical graphs. And here is an example, for example, for C68. Uh, they have uh, hexagonal faces and they have pentagonal faces and the number of pentagonal faces is constrained by uh, Euler formula. This uh, a pentagonal faces can be isolated or, as in this case, they can be uh, adjacent. There is a, a classification that has been uh, given by Fowler and Manopoulos, and uh, this is based on a construction in the case for the cosaedral fullerenes due to Goldberg and Coxeter, and for low symmetry fullerenes uh, on, on a construction given by Fowler, Cremon, and Steer. And the thing that you have to keep in mind is that for each CN, it's not that you just have this molecule, but you can have many more isomers. So uh, I'm just showing one, but then when we are looking at the procedure, there can be many more uh, isomers. So in principle, you can, can reconstruct many more and classify many more uh, nanoparticles. So this is the core of the procedure. What we have, uh, we have uh, uh, in uh, figure A, um, a portion of the graph of the nanoparticle. In black, you have the vertices of degree three. In uh, white, you have the vertices of degree five, and then you have rhombic and hexagonal faces. So we go from A to B, and going from A to B, we add in each hexagonal face a vertex of degree three, and we connect this vertex of degree, five, uh, of degree three to the vertices of degree five. So in figure B, we have a graph that is still related to the nanoparticle graph, but it has vertices of degree three in black, in black and red, and it has vertices of degree five and six in white. Then we take each of these rhombic faces, and for each of these rhombic faces, we connect the vertices of degree three by a dashed line that will become, become uh, uh, an edge of a new graph. Uh, after we have connected all the vertices of degree uh, three through the rhombs, we cancel all the edges uh, with the continuous line, so all the black, black edges, and we arrive from C to D, where we are left with uh, this uh, graph with the dashed, dashed lines, and the vertices, all vertices of degree three. Ignore for the moment these white points, they are not part uh, of the graph, they are just there for reference. And this corresponds to a fullerene. So starting from a nanoparticle, we are able to get to a fullerene in a unique way. But the problem is to get back. So what we have done here, going from A to D, is what we have called the vertex addition pool. We have added some vertices. Now we want to get back. So suppose you have a graph that is made by hexagons, has hexagonal and pentagonal faces, and has just vertices of degree three, and it's a graph corresponding to a fullerene. Now we want to get back. And in order to do this, you have to color just one vertex for each hexagon. And each hexagon has to be, have one vertex colored. And the choice will not be unique. So for each isomer that you will have here, it could be that you have no solution, so there is no coloring, or it could be that you have more than one solution. And when you have colored your, uh, when you have colored your vertices, then you connect, you add the central points, and then you connect these central points, the white points, with all the vertices of degree three, and you get back, you cancel the, uh, edge, the dashed lines, you uh, return to a nanoparticle graph, and then uh, you cancel the, um, the vertices, the added vertices, the colored vertices, and you are let, left with uh, a nanoparticle graph. So this is the idea under the procedure. So um, suppose you have a nanoparticle uh, with uh, capital N uh, polypeptides, and you want to know if you can uh, 
um, associate to this uh, a specific fullerene. So which will be, uh, which fullerene CN can we associate to it? Well, if we start from A, doing exactly the uh, addition rule that we have uh, uh, explained uh, in the slide before, here we have a number of vertices of degree three that is equal to five M. Uh, and we have also, we also know from uh, the slides before how many hexagonal faces we have in our nanoparticle, and we have m minus four nanopart, m minus four hexagonal faces. So if we add up these two quantities, we know that in uh, uh, in the portion of the graph uh, shown in B, you will have six m minus four vertices of degree three, and these <coughs> vertices will correspond to the vertices that belong to the fullerene. So the fullerene we are looking for uh, is a fullerene that is uh, equal to C6M minus 4. Keep in mind that you have a fullerene 6M minus 4, but you can have many isomers from this fullerene. So what do we have at this point? We have a procedure that allows us to go from the from uh, nanoparticles to associate to, from the nanoparticle to associate a fullerene, and we can get back, but not in a new, unique way. What we want to do is to classify the nanoparticles, so we go through the classification uh, for the fullerenes and then try to apply this to the classification for the nanoparticles. So in the case of the um, fullerene with uh, icosahedral uh, symmetry, uh, a construction like the one for Kaspar and Klug works. Uh, you can parameterize uh, your fullerene by uh, two parameters, and you can classify your fullerenes by uh, T numbers. In this case, you have T equal to seven, and the total number of atoms that you have uh, in your fullerene will be 20 times T. Uh, in the case, and this was the thing that was uh, nice for us, is in the case of lower symmetry, there is a classification the, uh, give, uh, given by Fowler, Cremon, and Steer. And here I show the construction just for the tetrahedral fullerenes. Uh, and uh, what you do is that uh, uh, the, the fullerene is given by four parameters. So if you start from uh, O and uh, you, move, you move in uh, the direction uh, E1 by a step uh, e, uh, I, so you move one in this direction, and then you move by a step J equal to two in this direction, you arrive in P, you draw, uh, you, um, you draw OP, the edge OP, and this is the edge uh, of uh, an equilateral triangle, what's called a big tr uh, equilateral triangle, and you will have a four uh, in uh, the final net for uh, the tetrahedral particle. Then you start again from O, you uh, move uh, from, of, of a step uh, zero H equal to zero in the direction E1, and then you move of a step uh, uh, two in the direction E2, um, E2 in this direction. So zero, two, you're arriving Q. Uh, you have an edge from zero to Q, and you draw here uh, an equilateral triangle, a small equilateral triangle, and you have four copies of tri this triangle in your fullerene. And what you get from by, by product, you get this uh, uh, scalene triangle, and you get 12 copies of this. So your final net of the fullerene will be uh, cut out from this uh, form that is made by four big triangles, four small triangles, and 12 scalene triangles. And you can uh, find on this, uh, uh, on this um, representation also the um, uh, axis, uh, uh, the rotational axis. So uh, rotation uh, threefold axis uh, sit in the center of the equilateral triangle, and the two-fold axis sit uh, in the middle of the edge QP. This is the representation for C68. So now we try to put all the information that we have just uh, in, uh, um, uh, in, uh, in, in one slide, and look what we can come up, uh, can, can come up with. So suppose you look for a tetrahedral nanoparticle that has uh, 180, um, 180 polypeptides. Then since it has 108 polypeptides, small m will be equal to 12, and you know that we, you will have to take the fullerene equivalent that is C uh, with the 6m minus 4, where m is equal to, 10, uh, to 12, so you will have to take the fullerene C68. And you go in the, in the um, um, Fowler uh, and Monopolis classification, and you look for all the uh, isomers that have uh, C68, 
10 minutes, okay. Uh, and you look for all the isomers that have uh, 68, uh, that corresponds to C68, and you look for all the ones that have or tetrahedral symmetry or a higher symmetry. Uh, in this case, I've chosen the one that has this parameterization. You, draw, you can draw the, uh, the fullerene, and then you get back to step one, where you were computing the number of fromms and number of hexagons in your nanoparticle, and you go back to step two, where you were computing where the trimers and when the pentam where the pentamers were sitting uh, in the fundamental domain, and if some of them were sitting in special position. What I've not said here is that the fundamental domain is between these red dots and the middle points there, so the twofold axis is there and the center, and the, the twofold axis here and there. So this uh, orange region, region corresponds to th three times to the fundamental domain. So you have to, it's enough to decorate the fundamental domain and then you can apply the, the symmetry group to reproduce the whole particle. So now we have to place the coloring where you, you already have the solo solution here, but suppose you don't have the red dots and you have to uh, understand where to put the red dots. You have some hints, some necessary condition from step one and from step two. You know that you have to place eight hexagons in the, fullery, in the uh, final particle, and you know that you don't have any trimer sitting in the special position. You don't have any trimer on the symmetry axis. So you know that the points that you are going to color are these special points that are sitting on, uh, in this case, on uh, the symmetry axis. Then uh, you um, do the construction that we have done before, so you connect uh, the vertices, uh, all, all the central points with uh, the vertices of degree three, and you cancel the edges that uh, you, you, don't, you are not interested, and uh, you arrive at this representation, that is a representation corresponding to the nanoparticle graph where the red points are the points that have been colored uh, in the nanoparticle but are not part uh, of the uh, nanoparticle, sorry, that have been colored in the fullerene but are not part of the nanoparticle graph. Uh, and here uh, is uh, uh, the classification going from uh, fullerenes to uh, nanoparticle just for the tetrahedral nanoparticles. So we are taking all the possible nanoparticles corresponding to uh, this number of proteins because these are the ones that allow tetrahedral symmetry. We have computed the uh, corresponding uh, fullerenes. We have looked at which uh, uh, symmetry were in the fullerenes. We have looked for the um, corresponding uh, parametrization. And after doing the coloring, uh, we have seen that for some of them the symmetry con is conserved and for some of them it's not possible to do the coloring, whether for others it's possible to have more than one coloring. And in some cases uh, the symmetry, for example here, uh, is even uh, lowered. And this is uh, the corresponding atlas just uh, for the three copies of the fundamental domain for all the particles that we have taken account into account just for the tetrahedral symmetry. We have done this also for um, lower symmetries. And when you have this, you can also reconstruct the full uh, three-dimensional graph. So you start from the three-dimensional uh, fullerene graph and you arrive to the three-dimensional um, nanoparticle graph, and then you give this to the structural biologists, and they get crazy, but they, in some, I don't know how they do it, somehow they fit the proteins inside, and they're, uh, because they can move the two vertices at two different, uh, at two different laser, layer, layers, and they reconstruct uh, the nanoparticles. And here are some of the nanoparticles that have been reconstructed in, in this representation. Uh, just, the, oh no, nothing appears. Well, doesn't matter. Just the other thing that I wanted to say, and then I'm, I, I finish. Um, as we have seen before, antigens are attach, attached to the particle to the particle surface. I don't know if you, uh, doesn't, it doesn't show. Uh, but what, what is important from uh, an article from uh, Dinsin and uh, Vogelstein uh, is uh, the density uh, of the antigen of the surface and the distance of the antigen of the surface. So having a model of the nanoparticle could help to understand which nanoparticle could be better uh, with respect uh, to others. And uh, here we have computed the distance between uh, uh, the trimers in the nanoparticles and the 
pentamers uh, in the nanoparticle, but just in the case uh, that the nanoparticle uh, are uh, represented by uh, a graph uh, on the sphere. So we, it's an idealized model, still an idealized model. It's not really the uh, final conformation that uh, the nanoparticle will have. So uh, what we have done, using tools from graph theory, we have developed a predictive tool to construct all possible configuration of the building blocks in the polypeptidic nanoparticles with uh, a given coordination number, three and five in this case. And uh, this symmetric configuration can be classified by a generalization of the quasi-equivalence that covers arbitrary quasi and fold position and arbitrary non equosahedral symmetry. And we have done uh, also, uh, and we have also given a procedure that holds uh, when the particle uh, is uh, not symmetric. Obviously, this has to be done uh, numerically. So still a lot of work to do. Uh, and uh, I thank my collaborators, Raiden Tuarok at the University of York, Peter Burke at the University of Connecticut, and Ringel and Ringel Mueller at the Geodzentrum in Basel. And thank you, I'm happy to take questions.